a great pleasure for me to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Dr. Luiso Nongsa, uh, who will address us. He is the, he's just stepped down as Vice Chancellor of WITS. We've been good friends for many years. He uh, studied at Fort Hare, then went on to do a PhD at, uh, at, at Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship in 1982. He came back and uh, taught at uh, Fort Hare, then he taught at, uh, at, in the National University of Lesotho, at UKZ, at the University of Natal in those days, then at, at, uh, um, at Western Cape, and that's when we met each other. And he was the head of a department, he was dean there, and then in 1982 he was, um, uh, got a call to, uh, to Witz, where he was the vice chancellor for for research, I think. And then after that, a year later in 83, he became the vice chancellor, uh, a position he's held for 10 years. Of course, he is closely involved with the mathematical sciences, new, new ideas for serving mathematics in South Africa and for building a stronger mathematical sciences culture in this country. So we look forward to your address. Thank you. Uh, I'm what stands between you and lunch? I'm, I'm standing here between you and a walk on the beach or possibly a trip to the waterfront. Uh, I will forgive you if uh, you don't listen attentively uh, because you'll pick up small things which are not quite accurate. Like my good friend, Dr. Max Price, described me as the former vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town. Thank you, Max. And I think Professor Klute demoted and promoted uh, Russell Botman as the vice rector and chancellor. And, and I didn't know that I was, I've been a vice chancellor at Wits for 20 years, since 1983, according to Barry. <laughs> I am truly privileged, really, <laughs> to, uh, I, I don't have a printer, so I've just written a few things here. Yeah, uh, First of all, I'd like to express my thanks and appreciation for having been invited to be part of today's function, uh, celebrating achievement. Celebrating the achievements of the graduates or the graduating students, uh, celebrating aims, having finished uh, 10 years of his existence. I'll come back to that. I am grateful to those who gave me information about today's function. Uh, when I asked how long am I going to speak for, uh, she said, keep it under two hours. <laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, she meant that the whole ceremony is two hours. <laughs> and therefore, I should use whatever is left, <laughs> which is about five minutes. <laughs> and... Um, well, at least from time to time, I would be the last minute speaker at the graduation, and they would give me some restrictions, say that uh, don't speak for more than 20 minutes. And, and secondly, uh, don't tell more than three jokes, <laughs> because your jokes are not funny. <laughs> uh, and also, that now you have been a vice chancellor for so long, you repeat the same jokes over and over again. And, and, and then the third re requirement is that uh, I, should, uh, I should say congratulations. I, I, I would like to congratulate the graduates uh, for your achievement. And I would like to repeat or follow the example of uh, Professor Neil Tarok and uh, the other speakers who have quoted from that icon of the African continent, uh, former President Nelson Mandela, about a ceremony like this one, and I quote, I've walked that long road to freedom. I've tried not to falter. I've made missteps along the way, but I've discovered the secret that after climbing a great hill, one finds that there are many more hills to climb. I've taken a moment here to rest, to steal a view of the glorious vista that still surrounds me, to look back on the distance I have come but I can only rest for a moment, for with freedom come responsibilities. And I dare not linger, for my long walk is not ended. And I think these words apply to the students who are graduating today. 
You have come a long way from grade one, and your achievement is truly memorable. But this is just one stop on a long way. I would like to congratulate your family members, your parents, your partners, your siblings. I would like to thank on your behalf the people who made this possible, the founder and the directors of this institute, the sponsors. And I would like to thank all the academics who have come from all over to contribute of their time and their knowledge in teaching at this wonderful institute. I would like to congratulate Ames on turning 10. It's really special to me that I've been invited to be a graduation speaker because until last night, it didn't dawn on me that my 10-year sentence with hard labor as vice chancellor of this university started around about the same time that this wonderful institution started. And it's truly a privilege for me to be part of today's event. I've been trying, I think, as Barry has alluded, to champion the implementation of a recommendation that appeared in a report on the review of mathematical sciences, namely the establishment of a national center for mathematical and computational sciences. I've been everywhere to try and champion this. I went east, Melbourne, Singapore, Hong Kong. I went west to Princeton and Brown University. I went to north to Oxford, Warwick. I didn't go to Cambridge. <laughs> and I went to many institutions in Africa, as well in South Africa. And whenever I talked about an institute for mathematical sciences in South Africa, the next question was, what will its relationship be to AIMS? How will it complement AIMS? And of course, for me, sometimes the disappointing news would be, don't ask for money. We are already supporting AIMS. <laughs> so I'm here now to ask for money from AIMS. <laughs> this next Einstein initiative is truly inspiring. I must say that. Because it brought to my mind when I first came across it on the experiences I had when I attended the International Congress of Mathematicians. I only attended two of them. Uh, in 1998 in Beijing, no, 1998 in Berlin, and 2002 in Beijing. Truly, truly memorable mathematical events for me. You have in this one venue, well, many venues, the highest concentration of the cleverest mathematicians in the universe. And it is an occasion to award what is called the Fizz Medal awarded to young, outstanding mathematicians under the age of 40 using just two fundamental criteria. One is the solution of a difficult problem. Well, not surprising, is it? And two, the creation of a new theory enlarging the fields of applications of mathematics. By the way, today I've come across an alternative proof to that old theorem we says that there are strong connections between mathematics and music. And the proof is the AIM song. <laughs> one of the things, one of the many things striking about attending an ICM is listening to people presenting sophisticated and complicated mathematical tools and techniques that often straddle these traditional boundaries between pure mathematics applied mathematics and statistics. Now, when I was in Berlin, one of the people who attended this conference was an A-rated mathematician from a small university under the mountain uh, who was really in awe of what he was listening to. And I felt a sense of comfort that both of us, the mathematics that was being presented, went way above our head. Now, I came away from that, I bought a book about the history of the Fields Medals. And what was striking, and still is, is that there has never been a Fields Medalist from the African continent. There is a disproportionate concentration of these winners at universities like Cambridge, 
one or two from Oxford, Stanford, Princeton, and so on. And the question that has come back to me over and over again is when will we have the first field medalist from the African continent? Or where is our own African Ramunajan? Now what I'm going to do in the three minutes that I'm left with, make it 30, <laughs> is to highlight why the odds were stacked against moi in being a field medalist. Now, I'm used to reading these legal documents, which says that in this document, I means we, uh, any word that is used in singular is also in the plural. Me means us. So whenever I say I, I also mean we. And whenever I say me, I mean us. Now, the axiom in this theory I'm going to present to you, there's only one axiom. Namely that somewhere in my genome, I have a mathematical gene to be a field medalist. And that it remained dormant for a variety of reasons. And four of these reasons, which I'm highlighting not because I'm hankering after a past that I never attained, but the take home message for me is that these obstacles that I'm going to highlight and including non-conducive environment, still persists. And we, not I in this case, we need to find a way to tackle this and address them systematically. The first one is our inability, especially in academia, unlike sport, to systematically identify, develop, and nurture math mathematical talent. It happens in pockets, possibly the math Olympiad and so on. We don't have a systematic, wide-scale way of identifying mathematical talent. Now, for the people of my generation from this part of the world, I can trace back this to a quote which goes to the year I was born, and I'm not going to tell you when, because you'll start then calculating how old I am. <laughs> it goes as follows, and I quote, there is no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? That is quite absurd. Education must train people in accordance with their opportunities in life, according to the spheres in which they live." End quote. That is Hendrik Vervoort in 1953. Oops, I've given away my age in talking about Bandu education. Now, as a result of this, mathematics was not offered at our schools. In my case, and in many cases of many people, like Mvuyo Tom at Forte, we had to change schools and take an extra year in order to catch up with mathematics. Mathematics was seen as a gateway to restricted careers, like being a medical doctor or engineer, and so on. Now, these obstacles persist because even up to today, we still come across students at our universities with wonderful marks, but in mathematics literacy, because they've been advised that ordinary mathematics is too difficult. And then we have no choice other than to advise them to take an extra year or two if they want to do engineering or medicine, which is what happened all those years ago. The other thing is that Good mathematics teachers get promoted out of the classroom. I would like to commend Ames and AIMSEC, which I heard about for the first time last night when I was in a taxi driven by somebody else. I was wondering, oh, these guys are from the Eastern Cape just like me. The second area, which for me was a big obstacle, is the type of undergraduate training I received at Forte. I'm not blaming Forte, it's a wonderful university which is going to finish under, complete 100 years in 2016. But the thing is, like many students of my generation who had a misplaced sense of confidence in their mathematical ability, is that I wanted to be a medical doctor, like Max Price. The first year curriculum mainly was biological sciences, and I was advised 
that please take some mathematics because you won't be able to get into Wentworth, which was the only medical school for black people. As a result, I only did pure mathematics in first year, where essentially it was calculus. I was lucky that statistics was a second year major. I mean, it was a two year major. I missed out on applied mathematics, and therefore these wonderful connections between mathematics and physics, the applications of mathematics which makes it come alive and much more interesting. And that has stayed with me all those years. And we still have that at our universities, not all universities. Unfortunately, because you have got a small concentration of very bright students like yourselves, academics tend to compete for students. Come and do pure mathematics and not applied mathematics. Come and do statistics and not computer science. There's a professor at a university near the mine dumps called Vets, who even said that the ability to do pure mathematics and applied mathematics resides in different spheres of the brain. What utter nonsense. But I actually believe that because it was serious when I looked at him. <laughs> the third area is that of postgraduate training at the master's and PhD level. Now, 90% of us, all those years ago, would be offered a scholarship. Go and do a PhD overseas. Doesn't matter what. It could be on how to count the number of angels that can dance. <laughs> and I'll say that for many African countries, maybe close to 100% of the PhDs were trained elsewhere. Now, because during that time we had no access to look at what were the developments in mathematics, you'd find yourself kind of peripheral to the major discussions around the key problems in mathematics. In my case, when I ended up at Oxford, I didn't realize that there was a big program involving mathematicians all over the world about the classification of finite simple groups. And after trying for six months, I gave up the unequal struggle and identified another pro, a, a supervisor who was the only person I could talk to about mathematics that I was doing. And you can sense that isolation that in the presence of all these great minds, I could only talk to one person about the mathematics that I was doing. That is still the case, but I must confess that there are interesting developments involving consortia of universities across the African continent. There's the African Economic Research Consortium involving universities like Cape Town, Wits, Nairobi, Ghana, Lagos. There is, or there are consortia of universities funded by the Wellcome Trust and others looking at research and postgraduate training in the area of health sciences. There's RISE networks funded by the Carnegie Foundation or corporation, again, bringing together or consolidating the strengths that exist at our universities. Because one of the lessons currently is that no university can be good at everything. And the strength of a university will be built on the nature of the partnerships that you can establish with others. The last one, before I s sit down and shut up, in reverse order, is the challenge that newly qualified PhDs from developing countries, and in this case, from African countries face. Because in our case, especially those that are first generation graduates or PhDs, their family commitments and work obligations. And I suspect that there are some of you who are facing that as you sit here that although you would like to continue, maybe and do a PhD, there's a mother and a father who says that you have been at school too long. <laughs> Please go and work and support us. For me and for many of us, a postdoc was not an option. So I found myself having finished my PhD at the National University of Lesotho where although maybe 80% of us had PhDs from University of Washington and so on, we could hardly understand what the work of the other was about. 
because somebody else was in a billion groups like myself, somebody else was on ill-posed problems, and so on and so forth. And therefore, one continued to work in isolation. And now when I talk about isolation is that there was no email. Can you believe it? There was a time when there was no email. <laughs> so if you wanted to ask somebody a question, you'd write a letter and wait for two months. <laughs> when today you can send an email and get an answer in 30 minutes and we don't know what the problem is. I was lucky that uh, the person who was my examiner advised me to write some papers out of my PhD. But after that, there were no grants. There was no international conference attendance. Limited access to journals. You go to a conference of the South African Mathematical Society, and it's almost impossible to set up any collaboration with anybody because we do different things. Now again, there are some developments that this is something that needs to be addressed that not all newly qualified PhDs can go on and do a postdoc. There's a report that was commissioned by the Association of Commonwealth Universities and the British Academy for Humanities and Social Sciences, which is called the Just Google Nairobi Report. It talks about the challenges that I've alluded to, about people going back to their universities, finish a PhD, somebody says that, Lois, so you have been away for four years. We have been doing administration, now you are going to be head of department. So at an early age of 30, 32, somebody is a head of department. Or somebody else now becomes dean at 35, and you think that that is an achievement. And meanwhile, you neglect your, to build your own research career. The last two questions that I would like to pose is whether in this very hall there is our own first field medalist. And whether in Kukuletu, in Crossroads, in the Cape Flats, we will one day, sooner rather than later, find our own African Ramunajan. We surely hope so. Thank you very much for listening.